My name is Alexis Davis. I'm the social media manager here at RSDSA. Tonight, I'm joined by Jim Broach, Executive Vice President and Director of RSDSA, and our special guest, Dr. Stephen Brule. Dr. Brule is Chairman of RSDSA's Scientific Advisory Committee, as well as a Professor of Anesthesiology at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Dr. Brule was also the co-director of the international team that developed and validated the Budapest criteria for CRPS, which is now the official worldwide standard for CRPS diagnosis. We are also lucky enough to have Dr. Brule's presentation, so you can follow along during the call if you are on desktop. It is linked in the description of this video. And finally, please remember that while the information shared here is helpful, please consult your physician for any personalized medical advice. Jim, is there anything else you want to mention before we let Dr. Brule kick things off? I just, just wanted to welcome everyone, especially the new people to our, our Facebook Live. Um, we Last time we had someone, we had 5,000 views, and I, I think we're going to go past that tonight because Dr. Brule is a tremendous intellect, researcher, man of science, and I think it's going to be a fabulous presentation. He's, some of the questions we received ahead of time, he's incorporating in his lecture, and will be a short time for us to have questions afterwards. So, Alexis, we're ready. All right, perfect. So we will get your presentation loaded. And Dr. Rule, you are good to go. Great. Thank you very much, Alexis and Jim. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. It's a little bit odd for me. This is the first time I've ever given a talk to a large group of people where I'm sitting alone. Uh, so uh, hopefully this will work just fine. I appreciate all the technology that uh, makes this possible. Um, the title of my talk is The Science and Mystery of CRPS, and that was actually a title that Jim Broach came up with, but I think it's appropriate because there are certainly a lot of mysteries about CRPS, and my intent today is to focus on the science of CRPS. So as much as possible, everything I'll be talking about today is going to be driven by things that are in the published scientific literature regarding CRPS. And I'm going to try to keep any uh, commentary that is just based on clinical experience to a minimum. Uh, so uh, organization of the talk is going to be kind of a variety pack. Uh, there are certain topics, including uh, genomic issues that Jim suggested covering, so I will be spending time on that. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, a number of newer findings, as well as putting together some older findings that you may not have seen put together the way I'm doing it today, uh, which hopefully will be useful. And then uh, at the end of the talk, there were a number of questions that were sent in. Uh, by interested parties, and I have tried to incorporate most of those into my talk and will address those. I'm probably not going to address all of them, some just because I couldn't answer them, uh, and we also probably are just not going to have time to get to everything. So let me go ahead and begin here. I wanted to start out, make sure... Uh, let me also say we have a dog in the house who hopefully won't be barking very much, but if he does, I apologize. <laughs> so I wanted to start out by making sure that we're all on the same page with what CRPS is. And when I'm referring to CRPS, what I'm talking about is a patient who meets the uh, diagnostic criteria for CRPS. These were published in 2012 by the International Association for the Study of Pain. Uh, they're also referred to as the Budapest criteria. So uh, to be diagnosed with CRPS, you're required to have continuing pain that seems disproportionate to any known inciting event. Um, and then we've got requirement that a certain number of symptoms, that is people, uh, things that people report, 
as well as signs that would be observed by uh, the clinician doing the evaluation. And these break down into four categories. The first is sensory, and this generally is things like allodynia or hyperalgesia. So uh, things like touch may feel painful or things that normally would cause a small level of pain hurt a lot. Uh, second category is vasomotor, and this would be things like uh, skin temperature changes, skin color changes. Then we've got a third category of pseudomotor edema, and this just means you've got swelling or sweating changes, uh, and typically these changes are reflected in a asymmetry where you see it on one side but not the other. The last one is called motor trophic, and this is things like decreased range of motion, weakness, tremor, dystonia, or uh, changes to the hair, nail, or skin, so changes in growth, either increased or decreased. So to get a CRPS diagnosis, you have to report something in at least three out of the four categories, and then the clinician doing the evaluation has to actually see uh, at least two of these four categories being present. And then finally, there's criterion four, which says that there's no other diagnosis that better explains the signs and symptoms. So it's kind of a rule out category. So what I wanted to start with now is uh, a figure that is attempting to summarize a variety of studies all in one place. This is the natural history of CRPS. Uh, and this is just kind of looking at what information is available out there on how frequently it, it occurs and what percentage of patients are affected under different circumstances. And I would just want to just kind of walk you through this. Um, and I think there's hopefully some good news in this for everyone. So there are a number of different types of injuries that are known to trigger CRPS. Uh, the biggest one is fractures, but surgeries are also a common triggering event, especially uh, limb surgeries. All of these are associated with tissue damage of some kind, and it's possible that most of these injuries at least cause a minimal nerve injury, if not a major nerve injury. So if someone has that type of event, the numbers that are uh, available from research studies indicate that about 92 to 97 percent of patients with these injuries will experience normal healing and resolution of whatever the uh, injury was. But there's also about somewhere between 3 and 8 percent of patients that experience an event like this that will develop what's often called acute CRPS. And this most often is uh, what's referred to as warm CRPS. That is, it's characterized by having warm skin, red skin, and swelling. Now, for acute CRPS, we're talking about a duration of less than a year. And one of the difficulties, especially when you're looking at really early CRPS, so maybe somebody who is two or three months post-injury, is the difficulty of being able to distinguish between real CRPS and what really may just be delayed healing with a lot of pain. Um, now, of these patients who develop an acute warm CRPS, the best evidence indicates that about 75% of those patients will have those symptoms go away within one year. And I definitely think that's good news. So if you happen to be somebody who's had CRPS for less than a year, your odds are pretty good that this will resolve uh, over time, uh, you know, within that first 12 to 18 months. Now, if you do develop this acute warm CRPS, there are about 25% of patients that will go on to develop chronic CRPS. So their CRPS lasts longer than a year. In many cases, it may go on for 10, 20 years. Um, and one thing that happens in the chronic CRPS that's different from acute CRPS is you frequently see a transition to more of a cold CRPS presentation. So this is where most often the skin would be cold, 
the coloring would be maybe bluish or darker, uh, maybe less edema. So among those who have chronic CRPS, there's one study uh, done in the Netherlands where they looked at what the outcomes were for patients who'd already had CRPS for a year. And they followed up with these patients about six years uh, afterwards. And what they found was uh, approximately 30% of these chronic CRPS patients resolve, which is very good news. Um, the condition is stable in about 54%. And really there's only about a 16% subgroup that go on to get progressively worse symptoms. Now, obviously this is the group of people that have the most problems and are probably the hardest to treat but uh, it's really, in terms of percentages, a fairly small percentage of people that develop CRPS. So if you work out the numbers on this, and let's say we started with 1,000 fractures, uh, we would end up with about three patients who are in this deteriorating CRPS group. So I hope what you take away from this is that odds are, in general, that you're going to have stable or resolving symptoms if you do develop CRPS. Now, uh, a question that was asked is, is there a test for CRPS? And uh, there was a paper published by a, a group of German researchers in 2018. They did a really nice job reviewing this literature, and their conclusion is that there is no definitive CRPS test. And that just means there's no one test we can point to that would tell us for sure whether a patient does or doesn't have CRPS. Uh, their sense was, having looked at all of this literature and knowing about CRPS, that there probably never will be a single test to tell if pa a patient has CRPS. But that's just a guess. We don't know that for sure. Um, now, it does seem like there are multiple potentially useful biomarkers. So maybe not things that we can hang our hat on and say, yeah, this one test means you've got it, but that these are tests that if you're positive on several of these, it's a really good chance you've actually got CRPS. Now, there was a meeting held in September of 2019 in Valencia, Spain, and one of the issues that was addressed was possible biomarkers. Now, uh, the, I won't go into great detail on this, but a few of these biomarkers that the scientists that attended this conference felt were promising was measures of degradation of bradykinin. And this is an inflammatory mediator. It causes swelling. It can increase pain responsiveness. Um, there's another one called osteoprotegrin that is a marker for bone turnover that uh, seems to be associated with CRPS fairly reliably. Uh, there are a couple of immune markers, and this is immunoglobulin G and immunoglobulin M, and there are certain characteristics of these that may be different in people who have CRPS. And finally, there are microRNAs, and this is just a very restricted set of microRNAs. And this, these are things uh, that are getting at the translation of DNA to actual proteins that have physical effects. And there are just certain microRNAs that seem like they are associated fairly specifically with CRPS. Now, this is very early research, but uh, certainly worth uh, further investigation. What don't seem to be good biomarkers which you may be surprised if you know anything about this, are cytokines. These are substances that trigger inflammation. Uh, and I'll talk a little more about those later, but they don't seem to be very specific to CRPS. Also bone scans, which uh, unfortunately many clinicians still seem to think bone scans are a definitive test for CRPS. It, it really is not uh, that useful. At best, it might support a diagnosis, but it's not very specific to CRPS. Also, things like sensory testing, responsiveness to cold, heat, doesn't seem to be particularly useful. Now, moving on, who is at risk for developing CRPS? So if we tried to go to the literature, uh, scientific literature, and create a high-risk profile for CRPS, 
really the strongest evidence we have, and this is from uh, at least two prospective studies where they followed people over time after an injury to see who developed CRPS. It seems like the best marker is having very high acute pain intensity following the injury. Uh, and pain is subjective, but it, it does seem that uh, people's reports of having very high pain are a pretty good marker for who's going to develop CRPS. Now, if you go to the epidemiological literature, so this is looking at populations of people. And, you know, one study was done in the entire population of the Netherlands, which has a socialized healthcare system. Uh, and another study done at the Mayo Clinic, looking at everybody in a particular county in Minnesota. Now, those two studies clearly indicate that females are disproportionately affected by CRPS. They experience CRPS about three to four times more often than males do for unknown reasons. Um, also, middle-aged individuals seem to be at highest risk, and this is uh, between the ages of 50 and 70. Uh, finally, if you look at what types of injuries are more likely to trigger CRPS, the single number one most common cause of CRPS is fracture. And this is about 40% of cases. So if we tried to say who's at high risk of CRPS before they develop it, we would probably say somebody who's experienced a fracture that's a middle-aged female that has high pain intensity. Not sure that's terribly useful, but it, if a person fits that profile, that might be somebody that the physicians would want to pay a lot of attention to and monitor closely for signs of CRPS developing because maybe they could intervene more aggressively early uh, and prevent later problems. Now, one thing that is commonly mentioned, and you can go back 50 years in the literature, even when it was called RSD, and there were many, many studies where the authors of the papers clearly thought that patients who had RSD or CRPS were crazy. Uh, and sadly, that was not an uncommon belief at that time because the symptoms just didn't make sense to them because they didn't know much about what caused CRPS at that time. Um, that belief that psychological factors somehow are related to development of CRPS have unfortunately continued uh, sometimes to the point of uh, certain clinicians who totally discount CRPS as a real condition. Uh, but if you look at the research that's been done, and there's been a fair amount done over the past 20 years, there's really no evidence that psychological factors cause CRPS. Uh, and in fact, the biggest study that has been done looked at fracture patients, uh, and this was about 500 patients who were seen shortly after they were seen in the emergency room. And there were not very many patients who did develop CRPS. And among the ones who did develop it, they didn't have any psychological risk factors. And a number of the patients in the sample who did have things like high depression did not go on to develop CRPS. That's about the best evidence you could hope for that CRPS does not cause, is not caused by psychological factors. Uh, one side issue here also is I've seen cases where um, a person having severe depression is used to say the person doesn't really have CRPS um, because it somehow discounts their symptoms. But the way diagnosis is done now, you can't get the diagnosis just based on self-reports from a person who has CRPS. You also have to have the physician seeing objective signs like measurable uh, swelling or uh, measurable color or temperature changes. And if you have objective signs like that, your psychological status really is irrelevant. Um, and I think that is something that is not appreciated by all clinicians. Uh, if you're using a, a criterion-based diagnosis, then those psychological factors are really a separate issue those psychological factors do, however, impact on pain intensity. Now, there are multiple studies that show that 
the relationship between being emotionally distressed and having more severe pain, which happens across all chronic pain conditions, is actually significantly stronger in CRPS patients. Now, this does not indicate that CRPS pain is all in a patient's head. Really, it's just a reflection of physiology. Um, and this has to do with uh, some of the mechanisms for CRPS that have to do with the sympathetic nervous system, which also is activated by being anxious or depressed. So there are these real physiological links that may account for this type of special impact emotional distress has on CRPS pain. Now, I just wanted to take a moment to go over uh, what's known as of now about the mechanisms of CRPS, and they are complex. So the name complex regional pain syndrome is clearly a good name. That is the case. Uh, and I kind of want to walk through some of these mechanisms briefly here, just as an overview. You may have seen this before, you may not, um, but it, of course, CRPS starts with some type of initial trauma to an extremity. And the example here is a case where you've injured your hand. Now, even with CRPS type one, which by definition does not involve a major nerve injury, there's a little bit of research that suggests even in those individuals, there are signs of some minor nerve injury. Now, nobody knows the cause of that, but there are some changes in the uh, density of those pain sensors in the affected area for people who have CRPS. Um, so it may be that all CRPS involves some degree of nerve injury. That's somewhat of an open question still though. So once you do get any kind of tissue damage, the body will automatically respond to that by release of various substances, including cytokines uh, and these inflammatory mediators that are designed to protect the area. So if my body releases a substance that increases pain, the evolutionary reason for that is if I broke my arm, it's actually an advantage for me to be more pain sensitive because then I'll protect that arm and let it heal. Same thing for swelling. So if I get an injury and these substances get released and it causes swelling in the area, that swelling is almost like having a cast on the area that helps protect it. So this is a normal response to injury. It may get out of control in CRPS patients or it may start normally, but just not go away as it would in normal healing. And one of the side effects of this inflammatory response is a sensitization of the pain sensors, which are called nociceptors in that part of the body. Uh, one of the changes also that happens with these nociceptors is that they become sensitive to uh, substances like norepinephrine and epinephrine. These are chemicals that your body releases in response to stress. So what this means is after you've had an injury and these changes have occurred, your pain sensors may actually become sensitive to these stress hormones that normally they're not sensitive to. And this could in part explain why things like anxiety and stress may be associated uniquely with pain intensity in CRPS. Now, it surprised uh, many people when they saw this, and this has been about 15 years ago, but there was always an assumption among clinicians that they were using sympathetic blocks for patients because part of the problem with CRPS was a hyperactive sympathetic nervous system. So the idea was that you're getting uh, uh, cold skin and sweatiness and cool skin in the area that's affected because your sympathetic nervous system, which is that stress part of your nervous system, was just way overactive. And you do the sympathetic block, you block that hyperactivity, and maybe you can block CRPS from being as severe. 
What they actually have found in a study of patients who experienced fractures and then they followed them to see who developed CRPS, they found surprisingly that it was the people who had lower sympathetic activity that were the ones that developed CRPS. So it's kind of opposite to what everybody had always assumed. But what may happen is, let's say that the injury causes some type of nerve injury that reduces sympathetic outflow. This ends up uh, causing an upregulation. So you get low levels of epinephrine, your body in that area becomes more sensitive to epinephrine. So if you get stressed out, for example, or just you're in pain a lot and your stress system becomes activated, that epinephrine now has more receptors to attach to and has more of an effect. So uh, genetic susceptibility certainly is something to consider and I'm gonna spend some time later on that in a moment, so I'm not gonna address it here. Um, all of these changes I've just described, one thing they result in is elevated pain and these pain signals are coming from out in the extremity and feeding towards your spine and your brain. Now, if you have constant pain signals coming in, one of the way, ways your spinal cord adapts to that is it actually becomes more sensitive to pain. So it's kind of like it takes less of a pain signal to trigger a pain response. You just become more sensitive to pain. This is a physiological phenomenon. It happens with all chronic pain conditions, and there's evidence that it does happen with CRPS as well. Now this will exaggerate the intensity of the pain. And in some cases, it may start to cause other parts of the body to become more sensitive to pain as well. So it has kind of a global effect. Now, if we look at the brain, there's a fairly consistent finding of changes in the representation of the affected limb in the brain. So normally in this particular part of your brain called the uh, somatosensory cortex, every part of your body is kind of mapped onto that. And different parts of the body have different sizes of representation in there. So it happens that your arms and hands actually have a very big representation. And in people who don't have CRPS, the size of the representation on the left side and the right side is pretty similar. What they've noticed is in patients who have CRPS, there actually seems to be a shrinkage of the representation in that side of the brain that is associated with the affected part of the body. So now you get an asymmetry in the body representation. Now there are numerous studies now that suggest that perception of the body is altered in CRPS patients. And this can even affect things like motor activity. So if you're doing an activity that requires you to watch things and pick stuff up and do things with them, you may have more trouble doing that because you, your body isn't able to get that sense of where it is as well. Um, so all of these changes though indicate that there are some kind of effects in the brain uh, that are associated with CRPS and that seem in some cases to be associated with the severity of certain pain symptoms. Now, a big question that we have to ask is there is evidence that all of these are associated with CRPS. The question is, are they actually causing or contributing to CRPS? And this is much harder to address because you really have to follow people from before they ever have CRPS onward. And that's just a very difficult and expensive type of research to do. There are, however, animal models of CRPS that do help address causation. And just as an example, one of those is a fracture model where in rats, they cause a limb fracture similar to what many humans undergo. And then they watch and see what factors are associated with later development of CRPS. And this type of research, uh, which has been done largely by David Clark and his colleagues at Stanford, these animal models, models do support some of those uh, inflammatory factors like cytokines being associated with development of CRPS. So 
here was one question that somebody asked and sent in, why is it so hard to make progress in treatment of CRPS and more broadly just understanding of CRPS? And I want to just give you uh, a conceptual model to think of this. So I just mentioned a number of possible mechanisms that may be associated with CRPS, and these are all supported by research. Now, if we plot all those out like I have in this figure, and now I'm going to put these salmon colored boxes on here, and every one of these patients could meet diagnostic criteria for CRPS. So for example, this patient one has peripheral sensitization, they've got some allodynia, they've got hyperalgesia, and they've got autonomic dysfunction reflected in temperature and skin color changes. Now in the right circumstances, that's enough to meet Budapest criteria. So that patient has CRPS, even though they don't have any of those other mechanisms going on. Now here's another patient. They have every one of these mechanisms involved and they have a wide variety of CRPS symptoms. They have everything. This patient also clearly meets Budapest criteria. Now here's another one, patient three. This patient may have had a known nerve injury, maybe it's CRPS type two. Uh, they're getting some allodynia related to that and they're getting uh, edema and uh, warm skin in the area. They may meet criteria for diagnosis, even though they look very different than the other uh, patients I presented. And finally, here's another one. Maybe it's a patient with high genetic risk. Uh, they've got this uh, altered body representation in the brain I'm talking about. So they've got some problems clinically related to that. They have some uh, edema, some temperature, skin temperature and color changes, maybe some uh, hyperalgesia related to central sensitization. So this patient also meets criteria. So what we've got now is these complex multifactorial causes of CRPS all supported by evidence. But if we apply the current diagnostic criteria, we potentially are gonna have very different patients who are all considered to have the same condition, CRPS. Now clearly there are a lot of differences between them, possibly related to the underlying mechanisms. Now this type of variability in CRPS is a real potential barrier to clinical trials. And I'll talk about that again later as to why that's important. And this variability may be an accurate reflection of reality. I suspect it is, but at the very least, it implies that we need to focus more on subtyping patients to find those distinctive groups of patients within the label CRPS that are all more similar because maybe those are the ones that have the same mechanisms and maybe they need different kinds of treatments. I want to go over some newer research on CRPS mechanisms and subtypes. Uh, first of these things is inflammation. And I'll say if you look back at the research literature 10 to 15 years ago, there was really very little talk at that time about the role of inflammation in CRPS. If you go back 20 or 30 years, really, it was pretty much accepted that CRPS all came down to dysfunction in the sympathetic nervous system, so autonomic dysfunction, and that was it. Turned out that wasn't true, and as time has gone on, all these other elements have been identified. So the role of inflammation in CRPS, I mentioned earlier, starts with some type of tissue damage that trigger, triggers this inflammatory response. Now that inflammatory response is driven by release of pro-inflammatory cytokines and neuropeptides. Now these, if you want to get specific, include tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-2, interleukin-6. Um, there are some others as well. There are things like substance P, calcitonin gene-related peptide, and bradykinin, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, all of these can uh, be associated with uh, swelling. They can be associated with increased pain responsiveness. And what's really interesting and I think convincing in terms of playing some role in CRPS is 
You can see it in the body of someone with CRPS pretty much wherever you look. So there's a research strategy where they put a suction cup on the skin and it sucks up and then you get fluid that gets sucked out of the skin with that. If you analyze that and you look at blood samples and you look at samples of fluid from inside the spinal canal, all three of those have been shown to have elevated uh, inflammatory cytokines and neuropeptides compared not only to patients who don't have pain, but even in some cases to patients who have other types of chronic pain. Now, having said that these are elevated in CRPS, there are a couple of good studies that suggest that these neuropeptides and cytokines may diminish over the first year that someone has CRPS. Not to say that it goes away entirely and that inflammation totally disappears, but certainly the levels of inflammation uh, are reduced. Now, I also want to mention here briefly this different pathway to inflammation uh, that doesn't have anything to do directly with cytokines, and this is called oxidative stress. So when the body has very high levels of oxygen, so let's say if you're undergoing surgery and have an oxygen mask giving you pure oxygen, uh, one of the things that happens is that actually stresses the body out. It causes release of these uh, oxygen-free radicals that can cause tissue damage. Now, another way you can get oxidative stress is when something reduces blood flow for a while, and then suddenly blood flow is restored. That also causes the same type of oxidative stress and can trigger inflammation in the area and possibly even nerve damage in some cases. Now, why this is interesting is that there is an animal model of CRPS1, so there's no nerve injury involved that is based on what's called ischemic reperfusion injury. So basically, this is where you take an animal, you put a blood pressure cuff on the animal's leg, you inflate it up, so it's uh, really high, that stops blood flow for a while. You do that for a couple of hours, and then you take the cuff off, you let blood flow get restored, and what happens is these animals do get an oxidative stress response. And in this model, what they found is that when you see that oxidative stress response, you also start to see features that look like CRPS, such as swelling, temperature changes, and hypersensitivity in the area. And this raised the question of whether maybe in some cases oxidative stress might be linked to CRPS in human beings. And uh, for me, the obvious place to be worried about this was in limb surgeries. Now, a good example of this is total knee replacement surgery. So during that surgery, they put a blood pressure cuff on the thigh, they inflated up very high, and essentially cut off almost all blood flow to the area for about an hour and a half. And once the knee replacement is finished and they've sewn up the area, they release the blood pressure cuff, uh, blood flow is restored, and then you get an oxidative stress response, or you should. There is evidence that you do get oxidative stress in this situation. What wasn't known is, is that degree of oxidative stress in a surgery like knee replacement associated with chronic pain or symptoms of CRPS on down the road. Now, this is something that we are doing an NIH grant right now to test, and we've only collected about half the patients so far, but I can tell you that this really good measure of oxidative stress we have that we obtained during surgery has been showing that people who have a larger oxidative stress response are the ones that six weeks and six months later also have higher levels of inflammatory symptoms that are characteristic of CRPS, like that warm red skin and swelling. So I can't say anything for sure, but there are at least some hints that uh, for patients who may develop CRPS following limb surgery, that this type of mechanism may be a, a relevant 
contributor to that. And the nice thing is, if indeed that's true, there are interventions that are fairly straightforward to use that can reduce oxidative stress and maybe minimize CRPS in that kind of surgical context. Now, moving slightly into immune system issues, uh, there's some really interesting work going on in this area. Now, inflammation and immune function are not independent. Those two systems are very much intertwined. And I think the most interesting that we've seen, and this is research mainly in the last 10 years or so, uh, is evidence that CRPS, at least in a subgroup of patients, has an element of autoimmunity. So this is basically where the immune system that normally attacks infections because they're foreign invaders, your immune system actually turns on itself and starts attacking its own tissue. So uh, there were, I believe, three studies that have looked at presence of these antineuronal antibodies. So this is a marker of an autoimmune response specific to nerves in the body. And these studies have shown that CRPS patients, at least about 30 to 40% of them, seem to show significant elevations compared to uh, healthy people. That does kind of suggest that maybe autoimmune uh, reactions may be part of the problem with CRPS. One of the side effects of these autoantibodies is that they sensitize our pain receptors. So you would expect people to become much more pain sensitive uh, in this type of autoimmune situation if they've got CRPS. Um, this really, in terms of mechanisms, this is a very similar pain mechanism to what happens in lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. The difference may be that in rheumatoid arthritis, these autoantibodies are targeting the joints and in CRPS, maybe it's targeting, for example, sympathetic nerves uh, or pain, pain nerves. Now, I think the most interesting work in this immune area for CRPS is what's called the passive transfer model. And this is work that's been done by Andreas Goebel's group in Liverpool, England. And I can just describe this in principle. It's really pretty straightforward. So what they did is they took patients who had CRPS and patients who were, and, and individuals who didn't have any diseases, and they took blood from both of them. And from that blood, they extracted immunoglobulin G, which is an immune factor that can be measured. So they extracted that immunoglobulin G, and then they took mice, and they injected the mice either with immunoglobulin G from patients with CRPS or from healthy individuals. And then they injured them with an injury like somebody might have, like a fracture or something like that. And then they watched to see who developed characteristics of CRPS. Basically what they found was when you take these mice and injure them and you've injected them with IgG from healthy individuals, basically nothing happens, they just recover. But when you give this IgG to, uh, from CRPS patients to an animal and you injure them, then you start to see things like hypersensitivity, so increased pain responsiveness. Uh, you start to see swelling and you start to see potential temperature changes. All of these are things that are characteristic of CRPS, which almost suggests that you've transferred the disease of CRPS from one animal being a human being to another animal via an immune mechanism. That's a pretty convincing evidence that uh, there's some kind of immune involvement in CRPS. Now this moves me into genomics in CRPS and you'll see why these are linked in a moment. Now, genomics is a broad term capturing everything related to genetic factors and I need to break that down into three areas. So the first area is genetics and I'm sure all of you have heard of this. This reflects the DNA that we're born with and our DNA never changes over the course of our life. So these are inherited, we get them from our parents 
And certain variations in the DNA we've inherited may increase CRPS risk. There have been a few studies that have looked at this. Not terrific because they're generally fairly small groups of patients, but what they have found is two kinds of evidence in favor of genetic factors contributing to CRPS. The first of these are not really genetic studies. These are studies that have followed cases where multiple family members within a family all seem to have CRPS. And obviously people within a family share their DNA and that is one argument for saying that there may be a genetic component to CRPS. Now there've also been some actual uh, genetic studies that have looked at DNA differences and they have compared CRPS patients to people without CRPS and what really has been the most consistent finding is genetic differences in what is termed the human leukocyte antigen system or HLA system and this is a really important part of the immune system that underlies our adaptive immune response. This is our, the part of our immune system that reacts to infections. Now there's separate from pure genetic studies, there's also the issue of gene expression. And I really wasn't aware of this till I started studying this stuff, but it turns out that your DNA you're born with doesn't necessarily translate into actual differences in your body. Um, it's really uh, DNA affects things only if that DNA signature that you have is turned on so that it's translated into producing proteins. And it's actually the proteins that are derived from the DNA that have health effects, which can be either protective or may make you at higher risk to have the disease. Now, there is one very small gene expression study that compared four CRPS patients with five non-pain controls. And this is a tiny sample, but you can actually do some meaningful uh, statistical analyses, even on tiny groups when you're dealing with this kind of data. The key finding in this study, though, was that two of the top gene expression differences that were observed between CRPS patients and controls were one was an HLA gene, so this is an immune-related difference, and the other one was in the gene that makes something called uh, matrix metalloproteinase 9, or MMP9. And this is a factor that's related to collagen, and collagen is the part of our body that holds everything together. So it's like what helps skin stick together, for example. Um, so keep in mind, this gene expression study shows this HLA gene difference and a collagen-related difference. Now, the last issue I want to talk about is epigenetics. So again, you're born with your DNA, but there are factors both in the environment and that are related to other genes that can affect whether our genes that we're born with are actually expressed. And so uh, one of these big things that is known to affect gene expression, so it's an epigenetic effect, is called DNA methylation, which is basically attaching a methyl group, it's a particular type of chemical, to particular locations in the DNA. And when it's attached there, it turns off that gene, so there's no protein expressed. Now, What's interesting is when you have methylated DNA, these changes, even though it may be due to environmental things you're exposed to, these changes can actually be inherited. So you can pass them on to your children and they can impact on health, even though the underlying DNA is unchanged. So it's really an intriguing thing to look at when you're looking at disease risk. Now, the best evidence for a role for DNA methylation in CRPS actually comes from a study that the RSD Syndrome Association funded. And I will say thank you again, because this is my study. Uh, we looked at, at a uh, group of military traumatic limb injury patients. So these were people who served in the Iraq war. They would had IDEs, so traumatic injuries. Um, these were all amputees.
So it's a little bit of an unusual population, but these patients with amputations, based on the uh, clinical signs and symptoms, we were able to diagnose nine of these patients with the Budapest criteria to say they had CRPS. So they had uh, allodynia, they had swelling, temperature and color changes in the skin, uh, things like that. And then there was a group of 38 patients who also had pain but it was non-CRPS pain that was determined to be nerve-related in origin. So we have these two groups, and we compared them uh, in terms of DNA methylation. Well, and we looked at about a quarter of a million sites uh, for uh, possible DNA methylation. And even though this number sounds small, it's actually very significant. We found 48 different genetic locations that differed between the groups in terms of methylation. And what's important is both groups had virtually identical pain intensity. So their average pain was both about a seven out of 10, but despite that same pain, there were these particular methylation differences. And the only difference between the groups is in those very specific CRPS symptoms like swelling, temperature and color changes, skin, uh, and hair changes and those kinds of things. And we found these 48 locations in the one group, but we actually took another group of thousands of patients in our hospital records that had information on CRPS diagnosis. And we were able to confirm that seven of these uh, particular genetic locations, even in this giant messy sample we had, seemed to be associated with CRPS. Now, what's interesting is where these methylation sites were. So if you look at the genes that these two top methylation sites were in, one of them was the COL11A1 gene. And this is a gene that regulates collagen formation. So just like that gene expression study, it suggests that there's some involvement of the collagen system in CRPS risk. Um, and that, I thought that was very interesting. We found uh, a similar uh, area affected in terms of genetics for both the gene expression study and our methylation study. The even more interesting thing is that we identified exactly the same gene, the HLA DRB6 gene, in our study as having a methylation difference associated with CRPS. It's exactly the same gene that was uh, highlighted at the very top of that gene expression study I described. So this is very strong evidence that this HLA system is really associated with CRPS. Now, I realize you probably can't see the details of this, but I will just tell you more or less what it means and I think you can get the gist of this. So if we look at all the different genes that showed methylation differences across these two groups, and then we plot them according to a map that says what those genes do. The most striking finding was that there were a large number of these methylated locations that were in genes related to the immune system. And that is very strong evidence, again, that there's something unique about the immune system of people with CRPS. Now, so what, what does this mean? It's speculation, but we do know that the HLA system is involved in autoimmune diseases. And maybe both the autoimmune evidence I described and some of the DNA methylation evidence I just presented, maybe this is really indicating that uh, genetic factors may influence CRPS via some type of autoimmune mechanism that involves HLA differences. That is not at all far-fetched, although we need to uh, prove that further. But I think it's really intriguing. It's a very strong finding. So the summary of everything I've just presented is that genomic studies and laboratory studies suggest that immune factors are an important contributor to CRPS. So if that's true, what does this mean in terms of treatment? So it might 
certainly make you start wondering, well, maybe we should be doing interventions that are specifically targeting the immune system in some way. And in fact, this has been attempted sometimes with more success than others, but a few examples here are uh, plasma exchange. And this in essence is filtering out the uh, relevant immune factors from the blood and then returning that to patients. And when you clear out some of these immune factors, at least two small studies seem to suggest that this is beneficial, that the symptoms improve. Uh, and I think one of the, the smallest of the studies actually showed that certain inflammatory cytokines decreased when you did the plasma exchange. So these studies are not definitive in any way, but they're a hint that treatments like this might now there's another type of treatment, which is intravenous immunoglobulin. Uh, and this is like an infusion treatment. There was a small pilot study that had very positive results. And I know that based on the questions that were asked, I think some patients were very excited about this. Uh, but unfortunately, there was a large trial that was a follow-up uh, in over 100 CRPS patients. And the results of that trial were very clearly negative. It really showed no value at all for people who'd had chronic pain beyond a year. Uh, I guess it remains to be seen whether short-term CRPS might respond, but clearly the majority of patients won't. Uh, one other thing that I'd like to mention is there are a number of drugs out there that are used to treat things like rheumatoid arthritis, and in some cases, even cancer. And these types of drugs modulate the immune system and in theory might be useful for CRPS. So Andreas Gobel, who I mentioned earlier, uh, conducted a trial of a very old, already approved drug called mycophenolate. Uh, and what it was a small study. I can't remember the number of people, but it was not a very large group. But they did find that the drug worked better than placebo in the overall group. If you look at his results, it actually seemed that there was a subgroup of people in the sample that got just outstanding relief from mycophenolate, and then another group that did not get as dramatic relief. So the benefits were driven in part by particular uh, people who were very good responders to the drug. Now, one problem with this particular treatment was that almost half of the patients couldn't tolerate the side effects and had to stop the drug. So that kind of thing would probably not be a reasonable long-term treatment for most people. It is encouraging though, and there is a, I think, a larger trial of this particular drug that's going on, as well as trials of related drugs that are planned. And given the mechanisms I've talked about, it wouldn't be as, at all surprising to me to find that some of these drugs might work and benefit CRPS patients. Now I wanna talk here a little bit about stages of CRPS and subtypes. Um, so, John Benica, uh, I think starting back in the 1950s, was considered the expert on CRPS or RSD, and he wrote extensively about these three sequential stages that CRPS patients went through. So you would experience the symptoms associated with one, one stage, then time would pass, you'd move to the next stage and have different symptoms, and then you'd pass to the third stage that again had different symptoms. Now we tested this, this was widely accepted for years that it was true, and we actually found a way statistically to test this. So we took a large sample of over 100 CRPS patients, looked at their signs and symptoms, and did a statistical procedure called cluster analysis, which allows you to recognize patterns among symptoms. And it, we told it to find three groups of CRPS patients. And we assumed that if stages really existed, those three groups would look more or less like Benica's three sequential stages. And since it's a sequential stage, the duration of CRPS should differ between the groups. And it turned out that there were no differences at all in the uh, length of time patients had had CRPS between the three groups that were identified and really our three groups boiled down to a classic severe CRPS patient 
who had every symptom that's known, and then two more limited conditions, one where the neuropathic pain symptoms like allodynia and hyperalgesia were most prominent, and then another limited symptom uh, syndrome that had things like skin color and temperature most prominent. Now, this uh, finding was replicated in a separate study done in the Netherlands several years later. So I think this is a very solid finding. The three stages of CRPS that get talked about don't really exist. Now, just because stages don't exist doesn't mean that there aren't real subtypes of CRPS. Uh, and back in, I think it was 2000 uh, or so, there was a meeting held in Budapest, Hungary, uh, where the Budapest criteria were initially developed. One of the topics we discussed there was, should we add different subtypes of CRPS to the diagnostic criteria? And there was quite a bit of discussion about warm CRPS versus cold CRPS, because people who see patients that have CRPS said it seemed to be a real phenomenon, that there were actually these patients that were mainly warm and patients who were mainly cold. We did not end up including these subtypes in the Budapest criteria because uh, everybody just felt that there was no solid evidence to really justify that. So more recently, we did a large study of 152 CRPS patients. And unlike most studies, which focused exclusively on patients who've had CRPS for years, our study included a large number of patients who really only had CRPS for a few months. So that was kind of different. And uh, we also followed all of these patients for three months. So we again use that cluster analysis pattern recognition technique, and we didn't even tell the software how many subtypes to find. We just said, tell us which subtypes there are and how many there are. And the computer, without any input from us, said that there were two subtypes. And if you look at what kind of features were associated with those subtypes, they totally paralleled the idea of warm CRPS and cold CRPS. So warm CRPS has warm red skin, was more sweaty, and there was a lot of edema. Uh, cold CRPS was cool and blue skin and less swelling. Now, what's interesting, if you look at these two clusters, uh, and this is comparing the duration in months for how long people have had CRPS between the warm and cold CRPS clusters, it's pretty striking. You'll see that virtually everybody with warm CRPS has had CRPS for only a few months. But if you look at cold CRPS, even though the mean is still relatively short, probably around a year, um, it's much longer duration. So this group of cold CRPS clearly is reflecting chronic CRPS patients and warm CRPS is really uh, reflecting acute CRPS. Now, what happens over the three months when we followed the patients? So we created a score that tallied up how many of these inflammatory features a patient had. And not surprisingly, the cold CRPS group had kind of low numbers of inflammatory features, and they didn't really change over that three-month follow-up period. But the patients with warm CRPS, so these were fairly newly diagnosed patients, when they were first seen, had a high level of this inflammatory score, but even over just a three month period, that inflammatory score dropped significantly and they started to look more like the cold CRPS patients. Now this is consistent with this idea that maybe warm CRPS patients over time transition to a more cold CRPS presentation. And while that may have been seen clinically for a while, this is really the first evidence that that kind of phenomenon actually occurs. So what are the treatment implications of all this? So in terms of drug development, there were several questions that had to do with that issue. Uh, one bit of good news is that as of about, I think seven or eight years ago, the Food and Drug Administration gave CRPS orphan condition status, which means they accepted that this is a condition that is rare enough that 
there are problems in getting drug companies to actually try to develop treatments. So this orphan condition status is really a good thing because it provides advantages, uh, several advantages to drug companies to encourage them to develop drugs for conditions like this that maybe don't affect huge numbers of people. And there's really the same kind of orphan condition status with the European equivalent of the FDA as well. So because of that orphan condition, several drug companies have tried to develop drugs to treat CRPS. And the bad news is that there are multiple recent failed trials. I think there is one that is still ongoing that we don't know the results of, but there are at least three that I know of that have failed. What is kind of disappointing is that the uh, several of those studies had to do with bisphosphonate drugs. And these are drugs that the research literature had suggested in multiple small clinical trials may actually work quite well for CRPS. So it was really a surprise when it turns out that these trials did not find that they helped with pain significantly. Uh, although I will say that uh, I can't really go into details on this, but the data from one of those studies suggested that maybe a subgroup of CRPS patients does respond really well to these drugs. And that group would be the ones that are more acute CRPS. Now, another kind of drug that was tested was an immune modulator and it didn't work either, unfortunately. So the problems with developing treatments for CRPS really stem largely from the complexity of the conditions. We talked about all those mechanisms that may contribute to CRPS. And ideally, the treatments we use for CRPS are targeting the mechanisms that underlie it. So it has been general practice in the past for clinical trials of CRPS to take all patients that meet diagnostic criteria. And I showed you earlier that even though they all meet criteria, they can vary quite a bit in the actual way that they look. And they may have multiple mechanisms. So what really may be the case is that there are particular subtypes of CRPS that respond quite well to a drug that's being tested and other subtypes that really don't. And when we mix all those people together, what happens is any signal that would indicate efficacy of the drug is washed out and it looks like the trial failed. And this is really consistent with some of the recent trial results, at least with one of the studies. The other big barrier to conducting more CRPS trials is these are very expensive, costing tens of millions of dollars. So it's a big investment. And especially with failures being common uh, in recent years, there is, I think, some hesitation to uh, embark on developing new drugs. That said, I do think as we learn more about mechanisms of CRPS, particularly things like immune factors, maybe there will be enough of a hint of benefit that one of these companies will take a chance on an immune modulating drug and maybe find the first treatment that could be FDA approved for CRPS. Remains to be seen though. Now, I know I've run a little bit long, but uh, I want to. I'm happy to stay, so I'm going to just keep talking. Uh, what I've done here is I've tried to respond to a number of the questions where I felt I was able to address it, and where it was things that might be relevant to a number of people. I will say that in general, if you're interested in learning more about all these different aspects of CRPS. The article that I reference here that I published back in 2015 in the British Medical Journal is a nice summary of what we know or what we knew at that time. And it is available free online. And I think that uh, Alexis arranged to have it posted online. So you should be able to download that. So the first question is pointing out a problem with the Budapest criteria for diagnosing CRPS. And the comment was, sometimes I meet criteria and sometimes I don't when going to the medical clinic. And aren't these criteria most appropriate only for an initial diagnosis? With the issue being that once treatment starts improving symptoms, of course, you're not going to meet criteria anymore if the treatment works. 
Now, this was an actual problem and an important one. And at that meeting in Valencia, Spain back in 2019 that I mentioned previously, that was one of the issues that was raised. So what's happened since then is we made recommendations for addition of a new diagnostic category that would be called CRPS with remission of some features. And this is designed to apply to people that meet the full criteria, the full Budapest criteria for diagnosis. But later on, when you try to uh, evaluate those criteria, they have some of the features, but not enough anymore to meet the full diagnostic criteria. Now, the uh, Budapest criteria were published as part of the chronic pain taxonomy published by the International Association for the Study of Pain. And um, that is something that it looks like they're not going to be updating any further. What they're doing is merging that with the uh, ICD-11, which is the new version of the International Diagnostic Code Manual. Uh, so the ICD-11 will become the place you go to try to figure out how to diagnose CRPS, and it will be the one, the location where a code would be available to apply to a CRPS patient that met this criteria. Um, it is not guaranteed it's going to get in there, but it certainly looked very promising because uh, Andreas Gobel and I have been in discussions with them, and it seems like they're receptive to including this type of CRPS with remission of some features into the ICD-11. And what that would mean is once that's implemented, if your physician sees you and feels you meet that category, there would actually be a numeric diagnostic code they could give, which might help with reimbursement and things like that. So question, uh, physicians often seem to question spreading. Is there evidence for this? And if so, what is that evidence? So what I can say is yes, spreading actually occurs. It is a real phenomenon, but it's not entirely clear how often it happens. And that has to do with the way that you have to study this. So there are two studies that have been published that have tried to characterize CRPS spreading. Both of them though are at single clinics. And I know from uh, just information that I know about these clinics, uh, from personal experience and from being told about them, these are clinics that are very specialized clinics that get unusual CRPS referrals. So they don't just get the patients who have CRPS that might be fairly treatable and straightforward. They get the people that are really complex that haven't responded to treatments. And because of that, patients with spreading probably are overrepresented in their patient populations. The numbers they publish on how often spreading occurs probably don't mean anything. Now, with all of that said, those studies do provide some information, but we do have to consider a definition issue. So uh, this is one thing that was discussed at that Valencia meeting, which we're trying to clarify for clinicians who are doing diagnosis. There is real spreading, but when we're talking about spreading CRPS, what we really mean is a patient who meets Budapest criteria for more than one body location. So if the spreading was from the left arm to the right arm, what that means is if you do a clinical evaluation, that patient, <clears throat> excuse me, that patient meets diagnostic criteria for both arms completely. That's real spreading. We also have the situation in some cases where uh, because CRPS is so painful, let's say of the upper extremity, maybe you don't move that arm very often and over months of kind of holding the arm in a position to protect it, you start getting secondary muscle pain in the shoulder and the neck. Now that is not truly spreading of CRPS. That's actually another muscular condition that's happening secondary to CRPS. The other issue has to do with that phenomenon of central sensitization I mentioned earlier. So this is when the spinal cord adapts to pain by becoming more painful. It is known that in some cases when central sensitization occurs, 
it affects more than just the one reason region of the body that was originally affected. It can affect a variety of regions, including in some cases, the entire body. So somebody with really dramatic central sensitization may become hypersensitive to pain throughout the body. And even though the CRPS with all the symptoms like swelling and temperature changes and skin changes, maybe that's all restricted to the arm but they have greater pain sensitivity throughout the rest of their body. So it feels like the pain is spreading, but really it's just the pain. It's not all the other features associated with CRPS. So these are kind of distinctions that we have to make when we're talking about whether CRPS is spreading or not. But if we look at these two large studies and look at what type of spread there was, uh, we, have some support for thinking you would see spread because some of the mechanisms I talked about, such as the diminished sympathetic uh, nervous system activity in the affected side, are not just on the affected side. Even when symptoms of CRPS are only one side, those sympathetic nervous system changes appear on both sides. And there are some other mechanisms that may be bilateral as well. And this bilateral mechanism is there, even though the symptoms initially may only be on one side. So the patterns of spread in decreasing frequency are mirror image spread. So if it starts on the left, it goes to the right side. There is also uh, an upper to lower limb spread or vice versa, where it starts in the foot and may then later be seen in the hand. Uh, those are the two most common uh, patterns of spreading by far. There are also in some people is diagonal spread, which seems kind of unusual, but apparently it does occur sometimes. So it may start initially in the left arm and then it is next seen spreading to the right leg. Mechanistically, I'm not sure what could account for that, but uh, there are some reports of that. And there are also uh, in some cases reports of spreading throughout all four limbs. And again, the question is, do all four limbs actually meet diagnostic criteria for CRPS, or is this really reflecting more of a central sensitization phenomenon? Now, when spreading occurs, it seems to occur on average about 19 months after initial onset of symptoms. So generally, it is not something that happens right away. It's when you've had it for a while and it's not resolving that you might start to see some spreading. But I don't want to give the wrong idea. Spreading is not by any means something that happens in everybody. I'm, I'm fairly certain that it's a minority of patients that experience this if we consider all patients. Um, and what was interesting, I thought, was that in many cases, anywhere from 37% to 91%, the spreading occurs only after a second injury. And maybe what's going on there is you start with CRPS in one extremity, and that makes you more prone to develop CRPS in other limbs. And in the right circumstances with an injury, you actually get uh, CRPS developing in that other limb. Now, <clears throat> excuse me one second. Another question is regarding whether CRPS in children is different than CRPS in adults. And I think this person that raised this question was noting that physicians frequently seem to treat childhood CRPS as more of a psychological condition than a medical condition. I totally agree with whoever asked that question because that is indeed a bias that's out there that kids who have CRPS, somehow it's not as severe a condition or it's mostly psychological. And if you treat the psychological factors, the condition will magically go away. I don't really see evidence to support that. Uh, one study I was involved with uh, in, done by a clinic at Harvard, uh, they actually found that the kids with CRPS, when you applied the same diagnostic criteria you're supposed to use in adults, you actually see real CRPS as defined by the Budapest criteria. So Budapest CRPS happens in kids and in adults, 
And the psychological factors that are associated with CRPS in kids are pretty much the same things you see in adults. So really very little evidence that there's any difference. One thing that may make a slight difference in terms of treatment just has to do with how children are dependent on their parents much more uh, than adults would be. So parents have a lot of sway over how kids react to the condition. So potentially there may be more room to involve parents in successful treatment of CRPS than would normally be the case for an adult, let's say to involve the spouse. Clearly that's important, but maybe more important to get family members involved if you're treating kids. Now, is there any evidence that CRPS and fibromyalgia are related? Um, a guy named Bob Schwartzman, who you, whose name you probably have heard, he's a very famous CRPS clinician and researcher that ran the clinic in Philadelphia at Hahnemann University. I actually heard him say one time that CRPS and fibromyalgia are the same thing. Um, I don't think he literally meant that, but I think what he was getting at is there are some things that certainly overlap between them. Uh, and I think if we look at mechanisms, what we really have to focus on is this idea of central sensitization syndromes. So I described the phenomenon of central sensitization earlier. So you become more sensitive to pain throughout the body potentially. It is well known now that there are a variety of different pain conditions that all seem to have a big component of central sensitization. And not surprisingly, people who have one of these conditions often have more than one of these conditions. So you get a clustering of these central sensitization syndromes. So this includes fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, migraine headache, uh, various bladder pain conditions, and there are others as well. So I think the common factor between these and CRPS might be a very high level of central sensitization. Okay, that makes sense, but I don't think it makes sense to go on further and say that CRPS and fibromyalgia are the same thing because fibromyalgia does not have the other clinical features that are crucial to CRPS, like swelling, unilateral swelling, unilateral temperature changes, skin color changes, changes in hair, nail, and skin growth. I mean, all those things. So there are similarities and there are differences. And here's another interesting question having to do with CRPS and gastrointestinal symptoms. Now it's been suggested that CRPS is doing something to my vagus nerve, which controls the digestive system. Is this possible? This is an interesting question because I just happened to be looking at uh, some work recently that gets at this. So there is a uh, measure that you can obtain in laboratory studies where you assess people's heartbeat and you look at the spacing between heartbeats. So uh, heart rate variability refers to whether the space between the beats is uh, getting longer or shorter or staying the same. Now, when we talk about the vagus nerve, the, uh, we talk about vagal tone. So this is this vagal part of your nervous system is an important part of your nervous system that generally inhibits things. So if you activate the vagal system, you slow down the heart rate, heartbeat uh, and heart rate slows down. So one of the things that they've seen is if you look at the frequency of heart rate variability, there are certain measures that are indicators of vagal tone. And there's one study that came out fairly recently that shows that there is low vagal tone associated with CRPS. Now this is not unique to CRPS. This actually occurs in most chronic pain conditions to some degree. Uh, and what's interesting is if you look at other work, low vagal tone is associated with digestive disorders. So there is a plausible pathway to say that maybe CRPS is linked to low vagal tone, which then affects digestive disorders.
So CRPS may not be literally causing the digestive disorders, but they both, may both stem from a common mechanism that's associated with both conditions. Now, one piece of good news is it may be possible to address low vagal tone, and this is done by doing abdominal breathing practice at a slow rate. So you're kind of pacing your breathing, you're trying to make sure that the breaths are not using your chest, but actually are coming from moving out of your abdomen, sucking air in, and keeping that breathing slow. So it's kind of like breathing to the count of end to the count of 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, and breathing out the same way to the count of six. So that's about uh, uh, six, beat, uh, six breaths per minute. If you do that, that will actually increase your vagal tone and may be helpful not only for uh, digestive issues that could be impacted by that, but there's also a lot of evidence in many chronic pain conditions that this type of breathing practice can help lower pain intensity. So it's something that's good to do for a variety of reasons. Now, another question was if CR CRPS occurs in the context of a nerve injury and the nerve eventually regenerates, would CRPS be expected to improve? Uh, my quick answer to this is that yes, if the nerve regenerates, you would expect to see very specific nerve symptoms go away. And this would be things like numbness and tingling. But CRPS, as you've probably seen, is very complex, and if there is nerve injury involvement in it, it's only one small part of the condition. So it would be pretty unlikely that simply having a regeneration of the nerve would suddenly make all the CRPS symptoms go away. What you might see is somebody that initially had CRPS type 2 where the type 2 was diagnosed by signs of nerve injury, such as numbness and tingling, they may no longer be type 2. They may move to CRPS type 1. So one person asked a question about whether CRPS is associated with sleep problems and asked if there are any ongoing studies of this issue. Uh, I don't know of any studies specifically in CRPS patients, but I think it's relevant to mention a study that we published this past year that was done in chronic back pain patients. So we were interested in looking at associations between sleep disturbance and chronic pain intensity. And one of the key findings of our study was that there is a significant direct association where poor sleep is associated with worse chronic pain intensity. But what was interesting was that there was also this indirect effect where sleep disturbance leads to greater depression, greater anxiety, and greater catastrophizing, and those psychological consequences actually then contribute to chronic pain intensity. So I think what this says is, yes, sleep is probably associated with pain in the same way in CRPS, and I would not at all be surprised to see these associations be complex, some of them physiological that are driven more by neurotransmitter changes, and some that are more psychologically driven. Uh, one person asked a very difficult question, which is what should a newly diagnosed CRPS patient know about treatments? Now, I will say a caveat here, which is I can't give really good medical advice to anybody. Uh, you know, I actually have a PhD rather than an MD, even though I have read everything about treatments that there is to uh, read, and I've written a lot about that. I don't make recommendations for individuals. That said, if I go to the research literature, I can say a few things. One of them is that, quite sadly, there is nothing that has been proven to be highly effective for CRPS patients across the board. There is no cure out there that uh, exists that some people may be unaware of. It does not exist at this point. There are also not that many good quality clinical trials to even test what works. So there's a lot of flying by the seat of the pants based on clinical experience. There's a lot of basing the treatments that we use based on small studies that may or may not be accurate. 
I will say in general that CRPS is a very complex condition. And because of that, it's more likely to respond if treatment is multidisciplinary. That means that it's affecting, uh, that it's targeting not only the medical aspects, but also targeting uh, functional aspects with physical and occupational therapy and addressing the psychological aspects. In many cases, patients can learn psychological strategies, even simple things like that breathing intervention I told you about, and it can actually help to some degree with managing pain more effectively. Um, I will also comment that if we look at the research literature as a whole, the evidence indicates that sympathetic nervous system blocks are not effective for the average patient. They don't provide any prolonged benefits. Despite this, sympathetic blocks continue to be used and in some cases are used repeatedly in the same patient. I would say that if you were a patient who is undergoing sympathetic blocks, if you seem to get really good relief from them that lasts a week or two, it probably is worth doing them if that allows you to engage in physical or occupational therapy better. But if you're not seeing dramatic, prolonged relief with sympathetic blocks, I think it is a waste of money uh, and it's very invasive. Uh, that's both my personal opinion and what the research shows. So if we look at what the best evidence is for treatments that might work, might work for CRPS, I would say that uh, clearly at the top of the list in terms of standard of care are to use an antidepressant, antidepressant and combine that with an anti-seizure medication. So an anti-seizure medication frequently would be something like gabapentin, but sometimes they use other ones. The antidepressants, uh, you generally want to focus on antidepressants that have norepinephrine effects. And typically this is the older antidepressants like tricyclic antidepressants, as well as things like duloxetine, which is newer and has norepinephrine effects. These are low risk treatments. Uh, they're non-addictive. They don't have a lot of severe side effects generally, and they may be moderately effective for pain control. They're not gonna be miracle cures though. Uh, a side benefit of the antidepressants is they also improve sleep, and it's possible that by improving sleep, we also might improve pain to some degree. There is actually a large clinical trial that was done that shows that physical and occupational therapy does have a benefit in CRPS patients. And if you combine that kind of therapy with rigorous efforts in the home to avoid uh, disuse, that means keep using the effective extremity rather than avoiding all use, then you may benefit from that. So avoid disuse, do those functional therapies. There is clearly some evidence that that is going to be helpful. Again, it's not a miracle cure, although I think in some of those cases where acute CRPS seems to go away in that first year, it may be in part because of avoiding disuse and doing functional therapies that keep that limb active and give it a chance to heal. Um, whether these kinds of therapies work as much for uh, very long-term CRPS is not really as obvious. Now I'll say for the specific case where somebody has very early CRPS, you've just been diagnosed and only had it for three months or six months, it is definitely worth trying a corticosteroid. Um, these have been shown in a, a number of small trials to have benefits in CRPS. And anything you can do that halts CRPS in, a tr in its tracks early on and can help you avoid going down that road and developing all those secondary mechanisms and secondary problems, that is absolutely the way you want to go. Now, uh, another thing, I'll skip one here for a second, but bisphosphonates, I mentioned earlier, there were at least four or five placebo-controlled clinical trials that suggested bisphosphonates work for CRPS. Those definitive trials, the big drug company funded studies did not show that they work, but having seen all the evidence, I still have a suspicion that there may be a group of patients who do respond to these drugs. Um, 
most likely based on the data would be patients with earlier CRPS rather than more chronic CRPS. Um, somebody had asked a question about whether bisphosphonates can make you worse in terms of your CRPS pain. I've never heard of that and I don't know the mechanism for that, but I suppose anything is possible. Now, ketamine infusions are another thing that there is some evidence for efficacy. Uh, and if you're interested in reading about that and seeing what we know about ketamine and its use for CRPS, you should see this article that I'm posting here on this slide. It's a good summary of things. Um, one person asked a question about whether ketamine would help with chronic CRPS. And the uh, hopeful answer is yes, it certainly could because one of the things that seems to happen potentially with CRPS as it becomes more chronic is that you get more of the central sensitization component. And fortunately, ketamine, the mechanism that it works by is directly targeting something that seems to underlie central sensitization. So in essence, when you give people ketamine infusions, it's blocking central sensitization, at least for a short period of time. And the idea is that that somehow helps reset the nervous system and improve symptoms. Um, now, any form of ketamine, uh, somebody asked a question about sublingual ketamine. Any kind of ketamine might work. The question is really, can you get high enough blood levels to actually achieve the benefits? And I don't really know what the answer to that would be. Uh, my sense is that doing ketamine once or twice is not really going to have uh, uh, profound effects, but some, the protocols that repeat it every day for a week or different protocols like that where there is repetition in a sh relatively short period of time does seem more likely to be beneficial in resetting the nervous system. Um, ketamine, though, is not a cure for CRPS. If you look at the best studies that are available, the benefits seem to last for maybe 12 weeks. You know, by the time you start hitting eight weeks, any benefits are starting to get lower and lower. And by the time you hit 12 weeks, you're pretty much where you started. So if you are going to rely on ketamine, you're kind of looking at having to repeat the, uh, the infusions at three month uh, intervals. So, uh, the other issue is you have to consider whether the benefits you're getting from ketamine are in line with the risks you're willing to tolerate. So ketamine is a drug of abuse. And part of the reason that is a concern is because ketamine is known to have adverse cognitive effects you know, on your thinking. Uh, and there's also a, a little bit of evidence that some people may experience liver damage to some degree with uh, repeated ketamine dosing. So this is stuff for your physician to just keep an eye on and for you to keep an eye on. It uh, doesn't say you shouldn't try it, but uh, we definitely need to know more about optimal ketamine protocols. Uh, somebody asked a question on low-dose naltrexone uh, and whether that works for CRPS. Uh, I know that that is out there in the community as being something that may help CRPS. There really are no clinical trials of that. There is one formal clinical trial that is stuck about halfway through, through and has been for several years for a variety of reasons. And other than that, we really only have a small case report that even suggests it's effective for CRPS. There's a little bit of evidence that a larger case series that it may work in fibromyalgia, so maybe it would also work for CRPS. But low-dose naltrexone does have at least a plausible mechanism for why it might work, and that is that it blocks TLR4 receptors, and this can reduce inflammation occurring in the nervous system that are related to microglia. Now, this whole low-dose naltrexone issue reflects the bigger problem in the CRPS literature, which there are many experimental therapies that are talked about, both by clinicians and patients and even in some of the published literature, but there's very little evidence to support these things actually being effective. And as you've seen in some of the examples I've given earlier, some things that seem very effective in small trials 
really aren't effective when you do a large trial that's definitive. So you're potentially wasting money on ineffective treatments in the absence of good evidence. Another question is, are opioid analgesics useful for CRPS? At least that's kind of the impression of the, what the question was. I wasn't totally sure. Um, there is one study of opioid efficacy for chronic pain that included a number of CRPS patients. And in that whole study, the results were negative. The uh, morphine, it was a form of morphine they were using, and it did not actually seem to create uh, significant pain relief over the long term. This is really the only data uh, in CRPS patients on whether opioids work. If you are using them for clinical purposes, regardless of whether there's research support, you do have to consider the benefits. That's how much analgesia you're getting versus the costs and risks. Um, you know, an obvious one of the risks is uh, risks of becoming dependent and even misusing it, uh, which can become its own problem. Fortunately, that's not necessarily the majority of patients, but it is a real risk. Um, I think a, a cost that is not often talked about, but is increasingly accepted as a real thing is this idea of opioid-induced hyperalgesia. So there are a number of studies that indicate that when people take opioids on a daily basis, especially at high doses, one of the things that happens is this paradoxical increase in pain sensitivity. So even though opioids are given to reduce pain, you actually can become more pain sensitive because you're taking opioids. And it becomes this vicious cycle, like a snake chasing its tail, where you take opioids to decrease the pain, but those make you more pain sensitive, which make you take more opioids, which make you more pain sensitive. And that, if it's happening, is a very difficult thing to get out of. Uh, I'll also just note that there was a, a daily electronic diary study that I was involved in, and this was in low back pain patients. But what we found was that if you look at the reason uh, patients are using opioids, it turns out it wasn't just for pain control. They were also clearly using it to help control their mood. And to the extent that that's uh, a reason somebody is using opioids, there are safer options that are probably more effective for mood control, such as antidepressants. Um, a final question, at least the pre preloaded questions, someone asked, which is a really good question, could CRPS increase the risk of experiencing a cytokine storm if I'm affected with COVID-19? Uh, and I mentioned earlier that there is this extensive evidence showing that cytokines, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, are elevated in CRPS patients. Um, and certainly, having a higher baseline level of cytokines and you add on top of that a disease like COVID-19 that also triggers cytokines, one possibility is that those cytokines add to each other and you end up with extremely high levels that create a cytokine storm. That's a possibility. The other possibility is exactly the opposite, which is if you have a condition that increases your cytokines already and is activating that part of your uh, inflammatory and immune system, that may in a sense desensitize you. So when you get a new infection on top of that, you don't react with a cytokine storm. And this is actually the rationale for some uh, interventions that are currently being explored to address cytokine-related organ failure in extreme burn patients. So I can't say for sure. It's theoretically possible that CRPS may increase cytokine storm rim, uh, risk, but it's also possible that it could be exactly the opposite. So I'm not sure how helpful that is, but that's kind of what we know. Um, and I think that is the end of my prepared slides. And I'm going to end the slideshow. And hopefully, there we go. Yes, here we go. Wow. I have Ooh. learned so much. Unbelievable. <laughs> we're, we're having a lot of people leave the presentation, but 
Alexis, any cu couple questions that we could share? So a lot of the questions that came up, you were able to touch on. Um, I know there are definitely going to be people who reach out to you and send you emails for some questions, but can I, I definitely- right, Can I interrupt? And I just realized one thing I meant to say that I forgot. I just saw the question. Please. I think I didn't say what DRG was or SCS. I skipped it. That was talking about treatment recommendations. That was talking about spinal cord stimulation and dorsal root ganglion stimulation, both of which have some evidence that they're effective for CRPS. It is not intended to be a first line treatment. You go to that if other things fail, but they do seem to work for a substantial portion of patients. And the evidence right now suggests that dorsal root ganglion stimulation may be more effective than traditional spinal cord stimulation. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but I wanted to make sure I did address that. No problem. Jen, did you see any specific questions that weren't addressed in the presentation or anything else you wanted to ask? No, no really. I'm, I'm glad just today we've gotten so many questions about CRPS and COVID-19 and that since it's a novel vi virus, it's very difficult to know exactly how people will be affected if they have an underlying medical condition like CRPS. That's true. Yeah. Definitely. yeah, we're kind of blind leading the blind at this point. No one really knows. Uh, and I think that the obvious advice is try to take the precautions you can to reduce the chances that you get exposed to CRPS. And beyond that, it's kind of guesswork. Right. Alexis, I, I, I think we could end tonight and um, just to reiterate this, the slides and the, and the presentation will be up tomorrow and that we appreciate that. And I'd be remiss if I didn't ask if, if our audience would consider making a donation to our organization as RSDSA, like so many not for profits have been really financially hampered by the pandemic. So I understand that it's, it's very difficult financially, but if everyone gave a dollar, that's a lot of money for us. We had 5,000 views last time. Definitely. So uh, just to get ready to end, as always, like Jim mentioned, this video is gonna be pinned to the top of our profile for at least next week. We already have the presentation up on our website. We will also make sure that we put this video on YouTube for anyone who wants to rewatch it. We always get so many people who watch it now, they watch it again. And people who could not make it tonight, they will definitely make sure uh, to watch it on YouTube. I also um, wanted to remind everyone, oh. Can I ask, actually ask something? Um, yes. Just so everybody attending, I see a whole bunch of questions uh, popping up in the chat here. Um, I am not physically capable of responding to every question. So if you're emailing me with specific questions, just because I have a lot of other job duties, I probably can't respond to those. But I would suggest that if uh, people who listen to this that still have specific questions that weren't addressed, maybe send them to Jim so he can compile them. And maybe we can put something together that in a systematic way would address common questions. Does that sound okay? That's that's more work for you, but I love it. Thank okay. you. Steve, it was fabulous tonight. And listen, remain safe and uh, enjoy your family while you're still working at home. Thank you very much. And Alexis, thank, you. thank you, as always. Thank you. If you have any questions, send us the email, y'all, info at rsds, rsds.org, or of course, you can send us a message here on Facebook. But thank you all for joining, and we'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.